Oh man, you know what sucks? Plateauing. You know when you're working out hard, you're training, nothing is happening. That's why we did this episode. We did a whole episode on ways to break through plateaus. Oh, oh yeah, that's right. We do a giveaway, don't we? I know that's why you're here. All right, so here's the giveaway for today. You get free access to MAPS Suspension. This is a suspension training program. You need no other equipment other than suspension trainers for this workout. So it's great for you guys and girls that want to change up your workouts or if you don't have access to a gym, little space. It's a great workout. Here's how you can win that program. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode to help us with the YouTube algorithms. Also, turn on your notifications and subscribe to this channel. you got to do all those things in order to potentially win this free program. Also, we only have 48 hours left for the sale on Map Strong and Maps Power. They're both 50% off, but that sale ends in 48 hours, so you have to act now if you want to take advantage. Head over to mapsfitnessproducts.com. Just use the code August Special with no space for the discount. All right, enjoy the show. Nothing is more frustrating than a plateau. How many times you got to get questions about that? Like, my body stopped responding. Yes. It's not building muscle. I can't burn more body fat. What the hell's going on? I'm doing all this stuff, and my body is frozen. In and place. I'm working harder than ever before. Yes. But you're not following a MAPS program. Mm, that's that's the end of the that's episode. That's your first mistake. No, you know what? Let's talk about all the different <laughs> things that you could do one by one, each of them by themselves, oftentimes gets the person's body to respond. Sometimes it requires changing multiple uh, things. So we're going to go down a list of all the factors that you could change in your workouts that can get your body to start moving forward again. So before we go into this, our, okay, so we're going to go over 10 different ways to potentially break through a plateau. Yes. But before we, because we listen and we know this, but so before we go into this, do you guys... Um, prefer to do one of these things at a time or will you pair them and if you do pair them let's save that for afterwards on your favorite ones to pair together yeah that's a great question and it depends how hard and how long i've plateaued great question okay absolutely all right so what's the first one first one is depends this one is by the way these are no real particular order but this first one is often one that nobody even considers they don't even think about changing the tempo of their repetitions. One of my favorite to teach. This is one of my favorites to change because it's easy. It's mm-hmm. like I don't have to do anything else except slow my reps down or speed them up. Like just change the tempo and be consistent with that change in your workout. And it usually is enough to get me moving forward again. Well, you can really like change the entire adaptation process by just this one factor. I mean, like to be able to stimulate fast twitch muscle fibers to you know have that kind of response it's a completely different response the and different signal you're sending your body just by you know increasing the speed of which you lift or you know the 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 way that you're the intention of of what you're doing with the exercise uh will will tell the body something completely different so uh tempo or to slow it down obviously uh is going to tell the body a completely different thing i love this one and i've talked about on the show many times before because one of the most common goals even if your goal is fat loss you you normally want to you know, tone or build muscle. Or at least keep muscle. Right, right or keep muscle. Um, more, more often than not, though, building muscle is, is in somebody's goal one way or another. And the protocol for hypertrophy, what the tempo looks like is a 4 two, 2 protocol, which is a four-second negative, right? So four seconds on the eccentric portion of the exercise, which, by the way, for building muscle is one of the most valuable portions of the, of the exercise. Yes. And almost nobody actually does a rep that slow. And I used to I used to love te- teaching clients that especially my muscle building clients that okay, I want you to look at everybody on the gym floor right now and find me one person and count their negative. Just, you know, count in your head and yeah, find, how long does it take them to get to the bottom yeah, of the squat? Find one person that actually does a 4 second or more negative and it's just unbelievably rare. And it also is a great way to teach form and technique, right? When you slow down the neck, where it gets sloppy is people let the let gravity do the work on the eccentric portion of the exercise. And a lot of times you're losing that tension on the muscle. And so teaching a client how to slow down the negative keeps, I think, better tension on the muscle. 
uh, slows it down so you have better control and form, and then also maximizes the benefits for building muscle. So messing with tempo is one of my favorite things to do. Yeah, now on the other side of that is, and this is definitely for those of you that already have good control and good stability, is it's lifting faster. Yeah, explosively. An explosive push press, or you're doing a push press and you have bumper plates and you drop the weight, so you're not even doing a negative, but it's all about this explosive positive. That change can oftentimes be just enough to get your body to respond. And, and also, to be clear, a plateau typically happens not because you've reached your genetic limit, like, oh, no, my body cannot possibly build more muscle or improve its performance or you know whatever. Oftentimes, it is what you're doing or what you're not doing. So for most of you listening right now, it's if you plateaued, it's because of something you're doing or something that you're not doing. The next one is another one that a lot of people tend to get stuck in, um, and that's the rep range. Most people, even those of you watching this show right now, think about how many reps you tend to hit in your bench press or in your row or in your squat. And I would bet money it's probably within the same four rep range. In other words, you know, oh, yeah, I tend to do 10 to 12, you know, or yeah, I like to do them around five or six, right? Most of us tend to get stuck in a particular rep range because we like the way it feels. Yeah. Either we like the pump and the burn from the higher reps or we like the feel of heavy weight of the low reps. Nonetheless, getting stuck in a rep range is a guaranteed way to get your body to stop responding. I find there's two most common people when talking about rep ranges. There's always exceptions to the rule, but the, the two most common people are somebody who uh, sticks to a rep range all the time or the person who claims to change it up all the time, but then they have no uh, structure around it. So they're like, oh yeah, you know, I, I do 10 reps all the time and I, the next day I'll do 15 or, you know, yeah. one exercise I do this and, but they have, they have no way to measure it because they never go, oh, I stick to this exercise for this long yeah. and follow this rep range. And then I transition to, they don't have a, a, any sort of structure around it. And they, they do understand the benefits of changing rep range. So they're <clears throat> always changing it ran randomly and don't realize that their body is probably very adapted to training that way and that there's no structure around to be able to say, oh, okay, when I do this rep range, these are the benefits and adaptations that I get. So those to me are the two most common is either somebody who is stuck in the exact same rep range all the time and they never move out of it or they are randomly moving in and well, out. Well, also there's a lot of tribalism around this in terms of like separating people in camps and where you identify the most as, <clears throat> well, I'm more of a power lifter. Or I'm more you know, of an athlete. I'm more of a bodybuilder. I'm more of this. I'm more of that. Uh, and usually rep range is, is very much like set in stone uh, in a lot of programming to where, uh, you know, this is, this is where I get, this is where I'm most comfortable and I've had the best results. So venturing outside of that is not really something yeah. I want to consider. Yeah, no, that's 100% true. In my experience, you most people do best uh, sticking to a rep range for about three to four weeks and then moving to another rep range. And when I do this consistently, I just feel the best. Uh, if I don't do this consistently, I start to find I plateau real hard. I start to get joint pain and things start to get, you know, totally stale. I just feel like if you don't structure it like that, that you still fall prey to the same habits as the person who gets stuck in the, the same rep range. Yes. You just, just do it differently, right? Yeah. If that makes sense. Like you are mixing it up, but you're still kind of mixing it up the same way all the time. I've also noticed that people who mix it up, you know, quote unquote, mix it up, they always do the same rep ranges for certain exercises. Sure. So yeah, oh yeah, I do five reps for a bench press, but I do 20 for cable crossover. So I'm doing high and low reps, but really it's the same rep ranges for the same exercises all the time. Yes. No, it, the, with the, the best approach, just in our experience is you pick a lower rep range or a moderate or a higher rep range and do that for most of your exercises and do that for about you know three to four weeks. And Justin's right. I think uh, in both these things we talked about, both tempo and rep range and many of the other things we talk about, uh, we all tend to fall victim of this based on the camp. Like you you brought that up for rep ranges. Why? I think the same thing for tempo. If you were an athletic guy, how do you move? Yeah, yeah. explosive. Explosive. Yeah, totally. Everything's fast, right? If you're a bodybuilder guy, you're probably the the, the group that does yeah. slow. Like I never did any eccentrics. You know, I had to really be intentional to do that because it was just like pick the weight up, then get rid of it. Exactly. And so I think that having some self-awareness around 
who you are, because we all kind of do gravitate to a style or identify as a type of a lifter, uh-huh. you know, is so the, the key to this is to be self-aware and who do I typically gravitate towards or the style I gravitate towards and then trying to move in the opposite direction for a while and you'll see extreme uh, all kinds of benefits in both the tempo and rep yeah. range. Now the next one is one that I was the, probably one of the last things that I ever started to manipulate in my workouts and really it came to me on accident. Um, for most of my personal workout career and my clients, what, there was always the same amount of time that we'd work out. So when I had a client, they come in, it's always an hour, right? If I worked out, I always had myself scheduled for two hours, which would give me time to warm up, work out, cool down, eat, whatever. And so my rest periods were always roughly the same. Now, I didn't time myself, but they were always roughly the same because what I would do is I would do a set. I'd walk to the water fountain, get some water, walk back. By the time I got back, I would do my set. And so I was probably around one and a half minutes to two minutes between sets, and I never really changed that. Now, on the, the accident happened when I started to get pressed for time. This happened after I had kids. When you have kids, sometimes shit happens in the morning. You, oh my gosh, my two-hour window, now I have 40 <laughs> minutes. Mm-hmm. How am I going to fit all these exercises that I normally do? And so I started supersetting or I started doing short rest periods and I noticed phenomenal results. It happened again this morning. Uh, this morning I came in, I had 45 minutes to do an hour workout. So I did much shorter rest periods and I noticed something completely different. Then I started to play with them in my programming and I got great results. I love mixing up the rest periods where I'll go 30 seconds in between sets. And of course, I have to go much lighter. I can't lift as heavy or I go longer and have much more time and I can lift up much heavier. Really changes the feel of the workout, the pump that I get, the control that I have. It's an easy thing to change. You don't have to change anything else. You could simply cut your rest in half or double your rest and then watch what happens. Again, here's the the groups, right? You have uh, the power lifter who loves to do a set, go do his knee wraps, yeah. wait three, five minutes, get some water. Have you seen those memes where they do a rep and then they like have a, a couch over there and they like <laughs> yeah. get, a, get a blanket on. Right. I'd be <laughs> sleeping. I mean, that is totally the, the, the power lifter, right? Three yeah. plus minutes, I want maximum rest between every single lift. And you and so you tend to do everything like that. And and just because even if you are a power lifter, it still would benefit you to to move this yeah. to break some plateaus. Yeah, throw it in every once in a while. Yeah. So even if you are someone that is the, that not only identifies, but you you are that that person. You still will benefit from from messing with this. The opposite. Then you have the other client who is loves the fast tempo classes that just can't stand. Everyone, we've all trained this client who you know you're telling them the rest. It's more often. What this else? Person. What else? What else? Yeah, what and they're else? dancing. They're like, "Well, I can do something else." Or, or "I'm ready. I'm ready." And they want to go right back in the exercise. And you're like, "That's been 20 seconds. Hold on. Like, I want you to rest for a whole minute." Right. Mm-hmm. So again, having self awareness around who you are like, and then trying to move away from that. And you know, I kind of was the the bodybuilder guy, right? So I fell on that like 90 second protocol is mm-hmm. what I just kind of gravitated. So this is something that I was guilty of for a long time, and I still to this day have to like focus on or otherwise no matter what rep range I'm moving in no matter what tempo I always kind of rest about that 90 seconds yep. it's just it's kind of my cadence right it gets the workout done in about an hour or so I can get everything done I feel good and ready to go so again I have to really challenge myself to either speed it up or get myself in the powerlifting mindset where I rest for longer. have some fun with this so here's what I would do is I would do my normal workout and I would look at my my time and I'd say okay look I'm averaging about 90 seconds next workout I would take a stopwatch because yeah. you will gravitate to what you did before even if you think you're going faster you might only be shaving off 10 seconds get your stopwatch as soon as you finish your set hit it and be like I'm doing the next set in 30 seconds oh boy It changes the entire dynamic of the workout. And the same thing in the opposite. Like you're a fast, you know, in between sets, take your stopwatch. Be like, I'm waiting a full three minutes. And you'll be like, I'm ready to go. Look at the stopwatch. Oh "Oh my God, I have another 60 seconds. Like totally changes the dynamic of the workout and it changes the stimulus for your body. Yeah. The whole concept of the pump was just a foreign uh, idea for me. Uh, until like I even I think it was back when I worked for Adam where he brought me out on the floor and was like here's we're gonna superset today I'm like what does that mean like, what, <laughs> I'm gonna what, work what are you doing that <laughs> yeah. just oh my god like everything just was just filled up and pumped and 
uh, it was a completely different experience. So it was the only way I could do as much weight or more. <laughs> <laughs> I see what you did or there. quickly figured that strategy out. Like, yeah. oh yeah, I get what this how this guy lifts right here. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it took that new stimulus to realize, wow, there's a whole different methodology that you can apply to your training. Yes. You know, I, I'm, I'd say that you know jokingly, but there's some truth to that. And and again, having self awareness around this, that what makes this difficult is you're inevitably going to suck. When, if you, when oh, you, yeah, you when switch you, to something new. When you move yeah. out of whatever you're doing uh, consistently, and that is the hard part. Yes. I think that's that you have, you're going to have to lighten the weight up dramatically yeah. because you just, it's an your ego body, check. yeah. And it, it or you're not going to sweat as much yes. because you're resting longer. Yeah, that's right. So you got to, there's definitely a, a mental game here where you have to be aware that you're going to be challenged, but the way you have to shift your mindset is that's good. That means if you, if this is new, it's difficult. There's a lot of room to adapt and change and improve. And that's what we're looking for when we're, when we're seeking for, to break through a plateau. Now, when you talk about rest periods, do you guys have, um, like I have a, like three ranges I like to move in and out of. I have the 30 to second, uh, 30 to 60 second range. I have the 90 second range, and then I have the like, which is 90 to two minutes, and then I have the three minute plus. Yes. Those are the yeah. three, Same here. three yeah. kind of sections. Yeah, I never go below 30 seconds. I feel like no. when you go yeah. below 30, you're doing cardio. Yeah. 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 So I'll go, thir I'll, same thing. I'll go 36, I'll go 30. 60 to 90, and then you're three minutes plus. Yeah. I, I do the 60 same 60 to 90 thing. is my happy place, but everything out of that is like uh, rough. <laughs> yeah. And I have to do it, though. Oh, the 30 second ones are fun. I mean, as long as you you make peace with the fact that you're not going to lift as much, yeah. man, the pump you get is just, it's it's intense. And that, that can get addicting, too. I hate doing that. I've, I've learned to love, and I actually didn't really learn to love this until really hanging out with you guys because I was never a single, double, triple type mm. of lifter. You know, doing heavy, heavy lifts, right? Uh, I the the three minute rest period in between, and since we built a business around yeah, like you get to work in between yeah, social media, I'll go up, <laughs> answer an email, and then I'll go back to a set. Like, and because we have our own place, you know, I can stretch the workout to be two hours if I want to. So I've learned to to like that that pace, even though yeah. I too gravitate towards the ninety second. Now, this next one, people change uh, quite often. It's an it's a it's a common one that people change. Unfortunately, people tend to only change it in one direction, okay? And that's to change the volume of your workouts. What that mean? What does the volume mean? That means the total amount of sets and exercises that you're doing in your workout. Now, when people hit a plateau, they do often change the volume to get out of plateau, but they almost always add volume. Add, yes. It's always like, oh, I must not be doing enough. I can't tell you how many times I've gotten people's clients, uh, excuse me, clients' bodies to respond in big ways by cutting the volume, by taking their total volume and having them do less. You may be in this category. Yeah. You, If you're doing a lot of exercises and a lot of working out, you've been working out for a long time and you're doing you know, 15 sets per body part or you know, per week and you're doing all this stuff and you think, man, my body stopped responding. I need to do more. Try doing half. Try cutting your volume in half. And here's what often happens. You get stronger right away. Literally yeah. within that same week, you'll it notice. It seems so counterproductive. It does. And it's hard. It's a hard thing to sell. And it's a hard concept to sell because all we've been fed for so long is like more is better, more intensity, more volume. Keep adding, adding, adding. But, uh, you know, uh, there's this speaks to the, there is the right dose for each person. And, based and that on dose what changes. Doing, it changes. And you have to be able to stay ahead of that and, and be able to take your yourself now into a new area of growth that you need to focus on. So I, I have a lot of thoughts around this one, um, mainly because it was one of the most impactful things for me uh, when I was competing as far as what what changed my physique like consistently for show over show after show. Now, the reason why I think the point you guys are making it holds true and it is probably more true than not is because I think everybody just thinks that more means more results. I think mm -hmm. that's just so common. If you're if you're a motivated person, you're in the gym, you're listening to a podcast about fitness, more likely than not, you're the type that just keeps piling more and more on thinking that you're going to get more results and there it, there definitely is a very there is definitely a sweet spot of rest and calories and how much volume you should be doing. Now, 
why this is so important or such a big one for me was never in my career until this point did I actually like mathematically track this. Like mm -hmm. I didn't do that until competing. Never had a reason to. I didn't care enough to actually sit down and calculate my total volume. And you, there's a, a math formula for this, right? So it's sets times reps times weight. And that gives you the total volume for whatever you're measuring. Right. So, so if you did 10 sets of 10 reps with 100 pounds, multiply them times each other, that's your volume. That's your total volume for that exercise, right? right? And so to make it easy, I picked like a, you know, the, the big bang for your buck type of exercise, the squat, the, like the big five that I was really paying attention to, even though you can count volume counts on all the isolation exercise too. That's what I was really tracking to see. So I'd slowly progress. And the key was when I first started was to, to follow the rule that I talk about on the show all the time, which is my goal was to do as little as possible to elicit the most amount of change. So I wanted to start with the bare minimum. You know, very similar to a, you know, pre-phase of MAPS anabolic. Two, two days of exercising, two sets of most of the exercise you're doing, full body type of a routine. Measure that volume out. Figure out where you're at. And then literally you only need to add 5 to 10% every couple weeks to that. And that, that will take you a really long time and you will continually progress simply just by tracking your volume and slowly, incrementally etching it up like that. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem is there's a lot of people probably listening right now and they're well beyond all that yeah. and your guys' rule and truth. They're already doing too much. They're already doing yeah. too and much. And that's why they're plateauing. Right. Is because they're overtraining too much all the time. So you cut their volume and boom, like magic, their body responds. So- you got to assess this for yourself. And by the way, here's the deal. Changing any one of these variables, at worst, you might not progress. Okay? So don't worry. It's not like you cut your volume and, oh, my God, all my gains are gone forever. No, you'll cut your volume and be like, oh, yeah, that wasn't it. So maybe it's something else. Let me yeah. try, you know, something else. The next one is the frequency. And specifically what we're talking about is the frequency of which you train each body part per week. Here's how I love to mess with frequency. I like to keep everything else the same and change the frequency. How does that work? Well, let's say I work out my back twice a week and I do 10 sets on Monday, 10 sets on Thursday. So that's 20 total sets for my back. I could also take my back and train it four days that week, but do five sets on each day. So five sets on Monday and Tuesday, five sets on Thursday and Friday, I'm still doing 20 total yeah. sets. You haven't for the changed week. the volume. You just spread that out. Yes, I've just increased the frequency. All else, uh, everything else is equal. And this was a game changer for me back in the day. I used to train each body part once a week with about 15 to 20 sets per body part. When I finally was convinced that maybe it's a frequency problem, and I took all those sets and I just divided it up over three workouts. That's all I did. It was like I turned on a light switch. And I, I felt it immediately. Literally within the first week, I could feel that I was stronger and things were responding. And it was really, really trippy to me. And so frequency is a very important one to, to well, look at. Well, a lot of times this can speak to people that have been running a split or, you know, a different type of a, a program like that versus like a total body type of, uh, you know, workout program where you can hit these body parts, like, like you said, a, a few more times throughout the week, but, you know, continue that similar amount of volume, uh, instead of just trying to pile it all in on one or two days throughout the week, it's, it's a pretty uh, massive shift, uh, on your body. Now, the thing that you have to be careful about is the same mistake that I'm, I bet we all made. I know I made this mistake for sure. When I, the light, the frequency light bulb went off was, Oh, well, I do, and I used to, back then, I used to split, you know, chest, shoulders, buys, you know, yeah. it was like set up with that. I'm like, okay, it the, sounds like the research says that two to three times a week per muscle group is the most ideal for building muscle. So I literally did everything that I was doing for my chest. The same workout. The, yeah. yeah, basically the same workout now three times a week. And so mm -hmm. I went from doing 15 sets on on Monday to now doing 15 Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And now I'm doing 45 sets for yeah, my right. chest, yeah. which now you fall into the pro problem and the trap that you talked about with volume. Way too much volume. I mean, yeah. what's the, the the literature is pretty clear on this. 12 to 20, I believe is-, is Yeah, a, or it's is, like nine to 15. Oh, is or that what it is? I thought yeah. it was 12. To, okay, so- Something like that. You know, so 20 is the peak, you know, and, here, and I made the mistake of going 15 sets, 15, 15. It's just- 
way too much volume. No, keep everything the same. Right. Just divide it up. So That is the key to this is to figure out where you're currently at if you're only training. You know, if you're doing a body part split and you want to try and mess with the frequency that, and go to like more of a full body type mm -hmm. of routine two or three times a week, then you need to measure what you're doing sets-wise and then keep in mind that this total sets in a week, the sweet spot is somewhere in that 10 to 20 sets, not much above it, not much below it, and to stay somewhere in that range and not to make the, the Joe Donnelly mistake and do 50 to 60 sets on a, on a, a muscle group. Unless you're completely enhanced, you're going to end up getting stuck on a plateau totally. again. Now let's talk about intensity, okay? This is another one, like volume, that people tend to only go in one direction. Their body stops responding, and so they say to themselves, I must have to work out harder. That must be the issue. I'm just not working out hard enough. So people do change the intensity, but it's almost always in the direction of harder. I'm going to talk to you about doing the opposite. And I know the reason why I'm doing this is I know a lot of fitness fanatics watch this show and a lot of fitness fanatics, that's our tendency. Our tendency is to go harder every time something stops working. Well, I'm going to convince you that sometimes you need to go easier. In fact, studies show that when people take a week, what's the, what do they call that week where people do a back off week? Uh, deload. Deload week. That when they do a deload week, the gains tend to happen right after the deload week or even during the deload week. Yeah. So this is what happened to me. I used to go to failure in every single set because I was convinced from reading all the bodybuilding magazines at the time that if you went to failure, you know you triggered muscle growth because failure was the very end. So go to failure no matter what, that'll get things moving. And so that's what I did all the time. And then I went back and started reading old muscle building books and publications. I'm talking about old. Like these were written in the early 1900s by people like Eugene Sandow, right? And all of these guys back in those days, this is before protein powders, create, definitely before steroids. And these guys were impressive. And I mean, I think Eugene Sandow would do a one arm bent press with like 300 pounds, which is, that's impressive now, Crazy. even. It's insane. And all of them said, Train hard, but l make sure you have enough energy left over for the next workout. And so the mm -hmm. way I interpreted this was these guys are training hard, but none of them are beating the crap out of themselves working out. And they only all worked out about three or four days a week. So I said, what happens if I stop going to failure and I just stop about two reps short of this? Now, here's the irony of this. The irony was as a trainer, I almost never train clients to failure. Never. Because every time I ever experimented with a client going to failure, they would go backwards. Now, for some reason, I thought my body was different, so I should go to failure all the time. But when I applied the same thing to myself and I stopped every rep short of failure or every set short of failure, about two reps, my body started responding again. So intensity you can manipulate and sometimes it's going lower intensity that gets your body to move forward well again. this is part of why when, before we started the conversation i asked uh, you guys you know i kind of prefaced it with you know are there things that you like to pair together and and the reason why i was alluding to that because i think that it's necessary for s certain things that you manipulate for example we just talked about increasing the frequency so if you were training chest intensely one day a week and you now disperse it over two or three times in the week, you have to manipulate the t intensity yeah. also. You can't keep the same intensity that you were training that one chest on the, or the or chest on one day and now do it two and three times a week right. or else you're going to run into this problem where you're over training and you're going to get stuck in another plateau. Mm -hmm. So you, you have to know that you've got to modify your intensity based off of other factors that you're manipulating at the same time too. So, And I think, again, talking to this audience who is probably into working out more often than not, and like Sal, you talking about the failure, that was one of the uh, biggest game changers for me during my fitness career was starting to leave what we call two in the tank. Yeah, I used yeah. to train every set to failure. Like every single set I was shaking or I had a spotter to help me finish the last three reps and simply backing off and actually leaving two reps in the tank for my entire workout actually busted me through a massive plateau. There was two completely different conversations I would have between you know my athlete clients versus my everyday average person client. 
Uh, and, and typically every day average person client, uh, you know, it, that mentality of going a hundred percent every time and like it, it didn't really exist. So that was something that I was sort of building my way up towards because yes, it is, there's value in that, but, uh, also it can, it can exceed the amount that's good Such for your body. Point. So, um, yeah, I, and me coming from the athletic background, I totally get it because, uh, every single workout in my mind was just like if I was practicing, which was, I want to drill at a hundred percent. Yeah. So that way it applies best on the field. But it unfortunately doesn't work that way when you're trying to build muscle. Uh, you know, it is dose dependent. Like I need to be able to apply what's most appropriate for my body to grow. So that's such a great point, Justin, because this is another one of those, you know, you need the self-awareness here to know who you are. Uh, because I did. I, I trained probably a split right here too. Like I definitely had clients that, you know, oh, it hurts, you know, because it starts burning. A little yeah. <laughs> and they want to back off the intensity yeah. all yeah. the time. That was you know? too much. Yeah. So. They, I mean, so you definitely had clients, their heart rate starts pounding a little faster. Like that. They're like, oh, I'm, I feel like I'm going to have a heart attack. I need to stop, slow down. So I had a woman yeah. literally be drop. Okay. Yeah. I had a woman literally throw her dumbbells on the ground because she's Ow. literally, she li <laughs> I handed them to it her. Burns. She yeah. she was doing reps. She did like three reps. I've she had goes, that, bro. She goes, how much do these weigh? And I said, oh, those are seven pound dumbbells. Oh my God. She threw them on the floor. I'm yeah. like, what are you doing? She's like, <laughs> I've never done more than five. I'm like, yeah. you were doing them. Why'd you throw them on the well, it's floor? It's just foreign. Yeah, so you got to like... know who you are. Are you the person that is looking for every reason to not push and not you know, stretch your capacity? Or are you the fitness enthusiast who wants to keep pushing themselves yeah. and more and more and more? And that's who's that you got to know who you are and where this applies because there is definitely uh, some value to increasing intensity with the right person. Totally. If you've never stretched your capacity before, if you've never trained to failure before, yeah. you're going to see tremendous benefit by actually intermittently doing that in your routine. But if you're the fitness fanatic, where or like any of us who train that was looking for every ounce you could get out of your workout, you probably could use a lot or you get a lot of value from backing off. Yeah, it's just it's just it's obvious that going harder is the next step, right? That mm -hmm. making it harder. It's not so obvious. That's why it's so hard to communicate. Yeah. That sometimes it's going easier, and that'll get your body uh, to move forward. All right, this next one. Is it sounds obvious, but uh, we're we're gonna explain to you how to make maximize this. Okay, so change your exercises. Now that sounds obvious, right? Oh, do different exercises, my body's gonna develop differently. Okay, let's get a little deeper into this. Here's what you need to do with this: change the exercises, and the best results you're gonna get are if you change if you change to an exercise you suck at. Okay, mm -hmm. so pick the exercise you're the worst at. So if you always do barbell squats with a barbell on your back and you're really good at them, but you've been doing them forever. And you're like, you know, I want to try a different leg exercise. Uh, and I know I can leg press and I know I can do, you know, a, you know, a, a Bulgarian split stand squat. Oh, front squats, man, I suck at those. I'm not going to do those. I bet you the one you'll get the best results out of is the one that you suck at the most. Yeah. And the reason is because there's so much room to grow. Yeah. There's so much improvement you can make. I, I mean, every time I've done this where I pick an exercise I suck at, I'll gain 10 or 15 pounds on that exercise every single week because I went from sucking to not sucking so bad to, ooh, I'm getting kind of good at it versus picking an exercise that, yeah, it's different, but I'm kind of good at it anyway. How much am I going to possibly add to that? Oh, movement? yeah. A lot of times why you suck at it is you know what you're not addressing in your, in your program right now totally. that's causing you to plateau. That was... You know, the case a lot of times, and that's why for me, and, and I know I can get into a lot of barbell training and a lot of like bilateral type of uh, training because it's, it's, I, it feels good. Like I can, I can really stack plates and I can add load and, and it's fun. And, and then when I go to do a uh, Bulgarian split, split squat or like lunges or things, I'm like, oh my God, I'm so shaking and unstable. And, you know, this sucks. I'm going to go right back to squatting. But, you know, to, to highlight that now and focus on that, bring it, you you know, a little bit more frequency uh, in terms of like rotating that into my workouts uh, makes a, a massive uh, difference and then also adds, you know, that, that, that stability that will bring my strength up even more in my workouts. I think this is, of all the plateau breakers, one of the greatest hacks for experienced lifters is this one. And yeah. the reason why I think that over the other ones is not that, that they don't work also, 
But when you're a new lifter, you could basically throw every exercise, any and every exercise. You suck any, them all. Yeah, you suck yeah. at everything, and everything is you're you're adapting and getting better. But if you've been lifting for a really long time, you've you've definitely identified what you do well. You've definitely gone through phases mm -hmm. of gravitating towards what you like to do, and there is definitely you've figured out what modalities of training you do not like. I don't like fucking around with that explosive stuff or that high intensity type of interval training. Like I don't like messing with that or I can't stand that really grinding, heavy lifting type of training, or I don't like Turkish get-ups. I don't have the mobility and the flexibility to do. Like you mm -hmm. definitely have shit. You know, when you, even be, if you're great at lifting, you've been lifting for a decade plus, there are things that you know that you're not very good at. And the trick is just to be able to, mentally focus in that direction because you will and you just got to realize that that you've gotten really good at a lot of things and the thing that's probably going to show you the greatest change or help you break through a plateau is focusing on the shit oh, you're not good at oh try this do this you've been working out for a while say okay i'm in a plateau i'm going to do a, a new workout for the next four weeks do this go down body part by body part and pick a lift that you suck at yeah. for each body part uh, and then for the next four weeks your goal is to get good at all those exercises that you suck at and watch what happens over the next four weeks. The progress will blow you away. You'll, you'll notice, okay, those that have been listening to the show for a long time and listen to our quads where we answer live questions and stuff, one of the things that you'll see that we almost always recommend the same program and the what I know what makes all of us choose that is we listen to what the person's saying. Quickly, we yeah. can start to figure out what type of person- oh, they, they avoid this. Yeah, yeah, we know how they train. Yeah. We know what programs we've written that are similar to that and then we know what are like polar opposite- of that, and we'll always recommend the polar opposite because we know it's going to show them the greatest change. Mm -hmm. We know that oh, okay, I can by what she's telling me or he's telling me right now, I can tell they like this way of training. So that's kind of like our anabolic program, or oh, that's like our performance program. So it's like okay, I'm going to shift this person to strong or power lift because I know that that's going to be such unfamiliar territory for them that their body's going to see the greatest change. Totally. All right. So this next one, a lot of people don't connect this one to plateaus. And that is uh, mobility. Oftentimes people don't realize that the reason why their body's not progressing is because their body is preventing them from progressing because it has its own too safety many governing in place. It's got its own governing and safety mechanisms to prevent injury, you know? So you've been squatting and you're stuck at 200 pounds and you think, okay, is it, you know, my diet? Is it the reps? Is it the sets? And you're trying all these different things and nothing seems to be working. Not realizing that the reason why your body is not letting you lift more than 200 pounds is because there is a mobility issue in your hips that your body's identified and said, if we go any heavier, we're probably going to hurt ourselves. And your body is very effective at doing this. I remember when I had my bench press, I don't remember what the weight was, but it was stuck forever. And all I literally, all I did was like two days of rotator cuff exercises. Yeah. And I added 10 pounds to my bench press. And it was why? Because my sh my body obviously identified that my shoulders weren't stable enough to go any heavier. So I strengthened a muscle that is not even directly connected to this. Not even a rotator cuff stabilizing muscle doesn't lift the bar when I'm bench pressing. All it does is stabilize the upper arm, right? But because I had that increased stability, my central nervous system allowed me to generate more force so I could lift more weight. So this is very now. This is obviously true for beginners. Like if I take a new person and I'm training them, I'm focusing a lot on stability and mobility. But advanced lifters, people been working out for a while, this almost never dawns on them that the yeah. reason why they can't add more weight to the bar, or the reason why they're not progressing, it's not because of any other reason than than the fact that their body is sensing instability or mobility. And if they just took a few weeks to focus on that, they break through the plateau. Well, not only that, they're just, they're not sensitive to their body signals, which uh, as they're going through this, like your body's telling you certain aches and stiffness and pains in certain joints are areas of instability or, or you know, lack of range of motion that need to be addressed. And so the common thought because of the way the industry is kind of set it up is, well, maybe I need, you know, wrist wraps. Maybe I need a, <laughs> to belt it up. Maybe knee I sleeves. need knee sleeves. Maybe I need whatever fucking device they can sell and push on you. 
uh, to provide that externally when there are methods uh, like mobility and, and, and drilling uh, these exercises to really build that back internally. Well, here's what's cool too that I, I found really fascinating uh, about this process for me because this is something that I really experienced later in my career was putting a lot of uh, emphasis on, on mobility is that when you do a lot of work in this direction and you gain this new range of motion, the amount of work you have to do to maintain or build the, the same amount of muscle is so much less than what you had to do before yep. to do the same thing. And I use this in my squatting. It's like, it trips me out how little and how infrequent and amount of volume I have to train my legs to keep the same size on them when I was hammering them in that short. I, I never used to break 90 degrees. Me going from now, from someone who never broke 90 degrees to all the way ass to grass is a dramatic j change of range of motion. And that newfound range of motion is allowed me to do way less work and still maintain the size of my legs with way more volume on it. That blows my mind. So if you find a way to increase your range of motion, and this is, I'm using legs as an example, but any, on any muscle, and you gain a newfound range of motion, you're getting more, you're getting, you are getting more work on that muscle for less effort and you will build more muscle. Yeah. So do this, right? So you're in a plateau. Nothing's, oh my gosh, my body's not moving forward. The next three weeks focus primarily on mobility. Not only will you improve mobility and connection and stability, but oftentimes that means for three weeks, you're not training with as much intensity and volume and you're giving your body a little bit of a break. Then you go back to your old workouts. You've, you're now rested fully recovered, you know, you're not, you haven't lost any muscle or strength because it takes longer than that to, to make that go away, but you got this new stability and mobility and you go back and work out and all of a sudden you feel more stable, everything feels better, oh, aches and pains are gone and then you watch the weight to start move uh, back up. And again, I found that this to be more true for people who've been working out a long time than almost anything else. All right, the next one is diet related. Um, and this one is uh, is an interesting one because uh, off I, it's funny. Either people think this is always the issue, or people think this is never the issue. So people fall into one of two camps. Like, yeah. oh my god, I'm not progressing. I got to double my calories. There's that crowd of people. Where, you know, what do they say? Like, there's no such thing as overtraining, just undereating, underfed. Yeah. yeah, which is totally not true. And then there's the other camp where you know, oh, my body's not responding and I look at the workouts and whatever and I say, well, well how's your diet? And then you see the, their face like, why are you asking me about my diet? What does that have to do with anything? Well, it has a lot to do with your progress. Usually, if it's not a, it's usually a macro issue, not eating enough protein or my carbohydrates are too low or something like that. Or more commonly, I'm not eating enough or I'm eating uh, or I'm not eating a, a, a little enough. In other words, I mean, I'm not getting losing body fat anymore. My calories are too high, or I'm not getting enough muscle. Your your calories are too low. I, I've found this most common, and and, and the biggest uh, game changer for these people it would be really common that I get somebody who hires me who is trying to reduce body fat. They're trying to lose twenty to thirty yeah. pounds. And they're training three to five, maybe seven days a week, anywhere in that range, right? They're training, they're training frequently and they're at really low calories and they're stuck in this plateau. And actually getting them to increase calories and maybe even reduce frequency if they're up at the seven, seven range. So less work, more food for the person who's trying to lose weight, which is really hard to get that mental shift is one of the best ways to bust them through a plateau. So long as I can get them to shift that mentality and they can be okay with the scale potentially going the opposite direction of their goal temporarily, they benefit the most from it. They've been in such a low calorie uh, phase and high amount of volume and frequency of training that their body has just become so efficient. It ain't building any more muscle. Mm -hmm. It's just surviving. It's mm -hmm. like you're feeding me 1,500, 1,800 calories. Yeah. You're training me five days a week week, all these sets and exercises, I'm just trying to live. I'm right. not going to build muscle for you right now or burn more body fat. You're not giving me enough. And are just hanging on. Right. right. They're just hanging. It's just your body's just hanging on. And so getting that, but that's hard, right? Because they're hiring me and they're, they're stuck in a plateau and they're trying to lose 20 right. more pounds. Keep going down. And I'm going to tell them, hey, train less and add some more calories and we're probably going to see the scale go up. It's really hard to sell mm -hmm. yourself as a trainer that you know what you're doing That and when they when they approach you with that goal. But the truth is, this is the person who probably benefits the most 
from this plateau right here is they've just been under eating for a long period of time and pushing the body so hard and they're trying to lose more. Yeah, or you have the opposite, right? That the person who's just always on this continual bulk and they're, you know, ah, I want my definition and I want more, but they're afraid of the scale moving in the wrong direction. This was me, right? Yeah. Yeah. It was funny because I was just eating too. I mean, uh, sounds obvious when I say it, but at the time it wasn't obvious to me. I was just eating too much. I cut my calories, I got leaner, and all of a sudden I looked bigger muscularly wise, right? Because I had more definition. So look at your diet as one of the factors that you could change to get your body moving. All right. So this last one is an interesting one and I'm going to give some specifics. Okay. So the last thing is to try a radical workout known as a plateau buster. Now I want to be very careful with this because (laughs) people take radical sounds crazy. It does. Well, people can take things to too extreme. Like, Oh, that's it. My legs aren't responding. I'm going to do 85 sets today of my workout or something, you know, and saying like that, that would be just, that was something that I would have done when I was younger. That's not necessarily what I mean. What I mean by a radical workout is something totally different than what you're used to. Here's one of my favorites, one of my favorite. And I literally recently discovered this and it works so well for me that this is something now I have in my back pocket is what I'll do is I'll take a day. This is why it's radical. It's not something I'll do all the time, but I'll take an entire day and every other hour or every three hours, I'll go do three exercises, three sets of each exercise. So I'm literally every other hour, I'm working out for 15 minutes. And I'll have a garage gym, so it's very easy for me. But I've done this several times, and it's remarkable at how much my body progresses when I do this. So to give you an example, I would do like barbell row, barbell bench press, barbell squat, three exercises. I'll do maybe five reps of each one three sets each. I'll start at 9 a.m. So I do that at 9 a.m. and then I do it at 11 a.m. and then I would do it at 1 p.m. and so on until about maybe 5 p.m. And throughout the whole day, it's like a lot of volume. It doesn't feel like it because I'm take mm-hmm. every other hour I'm off. But man, do I get great results. Now, keep in mind when I did that, my intensity was moderate. I wasn't going to failure. But you can try this. You could try something weird and something totally different out of the ordinary right. occasionally, and oftentimes it gets things moving. Yeah, and it's just one of those kind of a, a shell shock kind of a, a feeling that you're, you're placing on your body. This is where I like uh, some of those other kind of more, uh, I guess, advanced techniques and things like we mentioned with strip sets. And, yes. uh, you know, you can do like certain techniques where – um, it's a lot of demand. Um, the, either you're really ramping the intensity up in the workout or you're adding like, you know, quite a bit of volume that you normally wouldn't, or you're doing like an insane amount of reps, like hundred reps or something like of, of an exercise. I mean, it's just kind of one of those, uh, I'm going to get super stimulated in this workout, which then is going to carry me into, you know, my next workout with a completely different feel. I, when I think of radical too, I, I think that includes just radically different from what you're doing too, sure, yeah. right so you gave an example of something like radical that is you know extreme very extreme all day long event that probably a good portion of people may not be able to do or definitely not consistently do but i think radical also means radically different than what you would grab so instead of like kind of changing one of these things like oh i'm resting 90 seconds so now i'm gonna rest you know 60 seconds you know something kind of different it's like going the kind of complete opposite doing like, all of them this is actually something that uh right before we got on air so i'm coming up on almost a month of not training right now uh so i haven't i haven't got back to lifting and something that would be radically different from how i train is body weight or all suspension training like mm. i just don't i intermittently do that very rarely here and there but i love barbell lifting i love heavy barbell lifting i like building like a bodybuilder type of building but I just body weight suspension trainer stuff is the complete opposite of what I like to do, which I think, okay, I've been off for almost a month. I know I'm going to be weak as shit. I know my body is going to respond and build muscle to almost anything I do. Mm -hmm. This would be a good time for me to do an all body weight suspension trainer type of training for a while. And so that is something that I would consider radically different that falls in that category. What a great, what a great point. Perfect. If you train always like an athlete, Go train like a power lifter. If you always train like a power lifter, go train like a bodybuilder or maybe do body weight stuff or train with rings or kettlebells only. Yes. Like radically different from what you used to. And to break through a plateau doesn't mean you need to switch to this new workout style and that's the new workout style for the rest of your life. Do it for four weeks. Literally, just do 30 days 
of something completely different, then go back to what you were doing before. And oftentimes that's enough to get mm-hmm. the ball rolling again, and then you'll move past that plateau and then eventually hit another plateau, and then you can incorporate a lot of the stuff that we talked about in this episode. So look, if you found value in this episode, if it helped you out and you want more good, great information, head over to mindpumpfree.com. We have a lot of guides that can help you with almost any fitness goal. Again, they cost nothing. Mindpumpfree.com. You can also find all of us on Instagram. So you can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin, me at Mind Pump Sal, and Adam at Mind Pump Adam. 